Uh, so I'm recording this because, I mean, yeah, we did a lesson on, on graphing yesterday. I think we got the three examples, and this is one of those things that a little bit more explanation can really help for those of us that are struggling. But question one is not yesterday's lesson. Don't get me wrong. For question number one, to find the intercepts, we could graph. We know what the intercepts are, the x-intercept and the y-intercept. The x-intercept of where it touches the x-axis, the y-intercept where it touches the y-axis. You could, if you wanted to, graph question 1a, and then physically on the graph, see where it touches the x and y-axis. That is a viable option. But just like for parabolas and just like for lines, finding the intercepts just by reading a graph, if they're not nice whole numbers, you're not gonna be able to get them. So even though we can try to do this by graphing, we're not going to. It also takes more time, perhaps, to graph either argument. But accuracy is going to be a concern. So instead, to find the intercepts, we do what we've been doing for a very long time. We know the x-intercept is where it touches the y-axis. That means if it touches the y-axis, that's where its x value, sorry, the x-intercept is when the y value is 0. So I'm going to replace 0 in for the y to find the x-intercept, and vice versa. If I want to find the y-intercept, replace x with a 0. So really, this first question is lesson 3.1, the, the one that we did three days ago, uh, Friday, last week. So question number one is really our first lesson. Question number two is actually yesterday's lesson. So we're going to quickly review what we talked about before. I'll start with 1a. And I'm actually going to start with the y-intercept first, because I think it's the easier one to find first. But it doesn't really make a difference which one you do. So to find the y-intercept, every single time, a linear function, a quadratic function, a GIF, any time you ever want to find a y-intercept, of course there's always going to be shortcuts, but what will always work is take your rule and everywhere you see an x, replace it with zero. Now it's possible that when you're doing this, you're thinking, yeah, but how do I know which one I'm supposed to put for zero? Well, just think about that. If you're trying to find the y-intercept, you're not going to replace the y with zero because then there's no more, there's no more y to find. So whatever intercept you're trying to find is the other variable that you're replacing. So we'll place x with a zero, and then we just go ahead and do it. So let's go ahead and do that. At this point, I'm gonna skip the extra steps because this is just a calculation. Zero plus 14 is 14, 14 divided by three is 4.6 repeated. 4.6 repeated rounded down is four, with a negative is negative four plus one is negative three. We should all be able to do that. But, yeah, maybe I just lost 10 people there. So you know what? Yeah, let's do this in steps one more time for anyone who's still puzzled as to what just happened. So inside the brackets, I get 14 over 3. 14 over 3 is 4.6. 4.6 rounded down is 4. That means inside the brackets, I get a 4, and those brackets disappear because I've done that rounding. Well, the negative times the positive 4 plus 1, this gives me the negative 3 that I just made. I'm expecting that we could have really just skipped that, do that in your head on the calculator, and go right to the answer, but that first line of work would be the important piece. So there's my line intercept, negative three. Could we have gotten that from the graph? Actually, yeah, that's a nice number. We could have gotten that from the graph. Let's find the x-intercept now. To find the x-intercept, we're gonna replace the y with a zero. So everywhere I see a y, which is what my rule equals, I'm gonna replace it with a zero, and I'm solving for my x. There is no rounding now going on. This is the process that we talked about where we eventually will branch off our solution. In order to, to get to that point, I need to isolate the GIF. I need to get the greatest integer function by itself. I'll bring over the one, and I'll divide by the negative. If I bring over this one, it becomes a negative one. Then I divide by this negative, it becomes a positive one. I think we can skip that step. Easily do that in your heads. So that's my greatest integer function isolated. I'm going through this quickly because we did two days of this already. I'm now going to solve for x. I'm going to get x plus 14 over 3 is bigger than equal to 1, and x plus 14 over 3 is less than 1 plus 1 is 2. And I'll now solve each individual branch by itself. To solve this x, I'll multiply by 3, which gives me a 3, and subtract a 14, which gives me a negative 11. I'm going to multiply by 3 to give me a 6, subtract a 14, which gives me a negative 8. There's our solution. We've solved for the x in this We spent two days on this. We did a practice of the day before. 
We, uh, yesterday we did 16 questions in the homework and I mentioned to you explicitly, if you didn't get 14 out of the 16 right, like we need to figure this out. Not many people asked me at lunch, so I'm assuming we're all good. There we go. So there's your x-intercept, there's your y-intercept. Let's just talk about the x-intercept for a little bit. We mentioned this yesterday. If you were to graph this, that means you're getting a little flat constant section on your x-axis. So this is not the graph, but eventually on your graph, between negative 11 and negative 8, there's going to be a flat section on the graph, which is going to have a solid point here and a hollow point there. That's the graphical representation of what this x-intercept is. So if you were to graph this, you'd eventually get a whole bunch of steps that looks like are going down. And one of the steps would be exactly on the x-axis. And that step would look like that. We can see it's, you can see that step is three units long. Why is it three units long? It's the reciprocal of your b value that we talked about yesterday. That was part of yesterday's class. So there's the link between the algebra of solving it algebraically and the graphical representation that we talked about yesterday. Questions on it? Okay, so I'm just going to slowly start just plotting through the rest of these. I'll give you a minute if you need to, just to we'll look at B in a second. And like I said, we'll just continue sort of working through this. We'll just leave the camera rolling for now. Yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah, since you're dividing by three here, you're multiplying the other side. This step right here. How I got from here to here, you know what? Maybe I will show that extra step in case you got stuck for whatever reason. To get rid of the division of three, we multiply the other side by three. It's, it's cross multiplication, right? Three times one. So this will give me an x plus 14 is greater than or equal to multiply by three. That gives me the three there. I'm not dividing by three, I'm multiplying by three. Right? Algebra tells you to do the opposite of the other side. Which then gives me, that's where the 11 was coming from. The negative 11. So I'm multiplying this side by three, not dividing by three. I mean, you could divide by one third, it's the same thing. We'll look at B in just a minute. Something happens in B that's different than question A, but we've talked about it already. Same thing, for question B, we could graph it if you wanted to. I mean, look, if you are really quick with your graph, I guess, then it hurt. If the graph is not accurate, if the numbers aren't nice on your graph, then it's not really going to be a great way of doing it. That's why we sort of stick to our algebra here. B. Same thing, I'll find the wider set first. Find the wider set, I'll take my rule, and everywhere I see an x, I'll replace it with a zero. And sometimes questions are so easy they're hard. Maybe this is so easy that it is hard for you to do. Let's do it. Negative 0 minus 3, there is no negative 0 to 0. So 0 minus 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 rounded down, it's already an integer value, so you don't round it. It stays negative 3. So negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 7 is positive 1. Here's your wider set. I found the wider set first because it's the easier one to do. You're just replacing an x and finding the y. X-intercept is always going to be more work because we're going backwards to solve. Take a rule, put a zero into the x. Solve. If you haven't done so, maybe just take a minute right now and just do that right now from here. Just take it from that step. you're branching off at this point, the left branch and right branch, you're doing it wrong. There's no branching off. Mark? Uh, could you turn into all possibles? No. Like everything here? 
No. Because this is on the inside of the gray your function, you can't impact it the same way. So definitely no. You can't turn it on the time. So again, I'll repeat. If you're branching off and showing an arrow and an arrow, that's wrong. You can't do that. The reason being is because the gray your function is isolated, yes, but it's not equal to a whole number. There's no solution here. There is no x-intercept. What does it mean graphically? It means that if you were to graph this, this is not the graph part, but a quick little representation. If you were to graph it, you have a step above and a step below, and it skips the x-axis completely. It doesn't touch the x-axis, hence why we're getting no solution. That's the algebraic representation of where the graph doesn't exist. So no solution. Again, why? Because that's not a whole number. It has to be a whole number for you to be able to do it. So no x-intercept, no solution, then a for the long as well. So question one was less than 3.1. That should have been very straightforward because he's already spent two days on it, including a work class and two homeworks and all that. Question two, this is where I'm expecting some confusion because we just did this yesterday, so it's completely understandable that we haven't mastered it yet. Some of you have, which is fantastic, but I'm expecting there to be some problems with number two, so we'll spend more time on doing number two and going through this nice and slow. Is there a pause button on that? It's going, right? So you have to delete it. Anyway. Yeah, it's going. We're good? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start through the explanation for question two. If you need the explanation, follow along. If you don't need it, just continue working on what you're working on, and then we'll get caught up with the answers. I'm going to go through question 2A and 2B from start to finish. Full, full, full explanation. And then question C and D will speed it up. And along the way, I'm going to make some mistakes on purpose, and I'll, I'll sort of point out some things. I will remind you, though, that Graphing these GIFs is unlike a parabola or a line. In a parabola line, you can always just get away with just connect, getting a whole bunch of dots and connecting the dots. Here, I guess technically you could, but it's really not advisable to do it that way. So instead, what we want to do is we want to make sure we understand our parameters A, B, H, and K. And from that, we can figure out what the graph is going to look like, and then finally we'll graph it. So I'm going to go through that same process that I did in the lesson yesterday. At any point, if you want to skip ahead, then of course, please do. So all the extra work I'm going to do in yellow is really, you don't need. If you need, of course, put it. But some of you are capable of skipping this extra explanation going right to the graph. And that's what I'll try to do with questions 2C and 2D. But for question 2A, the first challenge is making sure that you know. Uh, by the way, I'm going to make a mistake on purpose in this question somewhere. See if you can find it. So somewhere in question 2A, I'll make a mistake on purpose. See if you can find the mistake. Uh, okay, so let's start. If I look at question 2a, my a, b, h, and k. a is the number you're multiplying in front. The number you're multiplying in front is 2. b is the number you're multiplying on the inside, but in front of the x, so it's a hidden 1. h is the number you're adding, subtracting on the inside, which is nothing, so 0. And k is the number you're adding, subtracting on the outside. So a and k are on the outside, b and h are on the inside when I say inside and outside of the function, the square brackets. So my a is 2, my b is 1, my h is 0, and my k is negative 1. There's challenge number 1, just to make sure that we know what the four parameters are going to do. Okay. Again, ask away if you're not sure about something. The next thing we said is we can use these four parameters to sort of analyze what the graph is going to look like, because everything here gives us something. The h and k gives us our vertex of 0, negative 1. That means my vertex will always be a solid point. There was someone in my homeroom class that was graphing it and didn't realize and thought it was going to, was going to be an exclusion point, like a hollow point. No, no, it's always going to be a solid point. So wherever this point is, that's sort of an anchor point. It's a point where I can start making my graph from there, and it's always going to be a solid point. My a and b. Um, was it? There was an argument, not an argument, but there was a mass amount of confusion in my homeroom class. It was Jordan and Dea and Finn and Axel were all in the middle of the room complaining and saying, saying stuff that was wrong. Someone was saying that the A is your height, the B is your length. No, absolutely not. The A is not your height and the B is not your length. Because if that was the case, then that means in yesterday's class, I would have wrote an equal sign to say that that's your height and that's your length. But if you notice, I didn't. I didn't actually write an equal sign. Because it's not equal to your height, it's not equal to your length. It could be, but not in all cases. 
What A does, A gives you your height, and B gives you your length. It helps you get the height, and it helps you get the length. There's a nuance there, right? I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it helps you get it. The height is going to be the positive version of your A. So whatever your A is, make it positive. So in this case, positive two is a positive two. But sir, you just lied to us. You said it's not your height. Yeah, but it won't always be, right? If this is a negative number, if that was a negative two, your height's not negative two. It helps you get your height. Your length comes from B. It's the positive reciprocal of this number. There's two things that I just said, positive reciprocal. Positive means make the number positive. So whatever this is, make it positive. It's a one, so I guess it's a one. Reciprocal means flip the fraction. This number is a fraction, even if it's a whole number, because we know a whole number can be written as something over one. So if I flip this fraction, I get one. It doesn't change. And then it appears that I'm a liar. You look at this and think, you just said, sir, the height is not A and the length is not B, and yet it is here. Yeah, it is here in this specific scenario, but it's not going to be the same thing with the other ones. So the height comes from the A, the length comes from the B, but it's not the same thing necessarily. Finally, the last thing I can say, again, I said I'm going to make a mistake on purpose, I'm just reminding you about that. The last thing about this is I need to figure out the orientation of my steps. And I get that not from the height and the length, but from my original A and B values. So this two and one. Not this two and one, but this two and one. I say that because if these were negatives, it would make a difference here. And in class, I talk about this three different ways. I said those of you that are visual will realize that when A and B are positive or negative, you're either going to get vertical reflections or horizontal reflections of that original graph. And if you're a visual person, that made a lot of sense. If you weren't a visual person, you're more of a math person, I mentioned that the B dictates whether or not you're going to start with open or closed. If your B is positive, you start with closed. If your B is negative, you start with open. And the product of A and B tells you if your steps are going up or if going down. Then I said, okay, look, worst case scenario, if you don't know what I just said, I drew a chart. I drew a chart on the board, and the chart will give you the answer. Now, there's a bit of a drawback. If you're going to rely on the chart, that means you don't really understand perhaps what's going on. So as soon as we start making some changes, if all you're doing is trying to memorize a chart, it could go a little awry. I'm just reminding you about that. So those are three different ways. Those three different ways, I don't do any of them. Let me show you how I do it. It's always nice if you can remember a, a way of doing something that's your own. Because if you can make it your own, that means you've made your own little brain synapses fire and you made own, your own connections in your brain. Um, do you guys remember at some point, I don't know when you did this, maybe two years ago, three years ago. Do you remember your, um, your scale, your conversion scale between like kilometers and, and hectometers and decameters? And you came up perhaps with a mnemonic device, a way to help you remember. The King Henry blah, 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 chocolate, something, something. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. I was working with my niece over the weekend and she was going through that conversion scale and I talked about, hey, can you come up with your own little thing about it? The K, the H, the DA, the B for the base, and so on and so on. She's like, sure, blah, blah, blah. And she came up with koalas have, she remembered this because it was hers. Koalas have dads, but don't see their moms. Pretty sad, but she remembers it that way. But now she remembers koalas have dads, but don't see their moms. So she knows her kingdom, or sorry, her, her kilo and your hecta and your deca and so on and so on. So the same thing happens here. This is how I do it. A and B are a couple. They're in a relationship. When they both see eye to eye, the relationship goes well. A and B are in a couple. They're not getting along. If they're not getting along, the relationship is in the point. That helps, that's actually literally how I do it. Because it works in my brain really, really quickly, and I can, since I already understand the math, then I can find a trick around it. But then you might look at this and say, yeah, but sir, how do you remember if you're starting with an open versus closed, that's easy. B could either be positive or negative. Put a little circle around it. Which one looks closer to a solid point? It's literally more filled in. There's more things in there. So if your B is positive, you're starting with a solid point. If your B is negative, you start with all of It makes no difference how you remember it. Just find a way that works for you. The chart, the math, visual, or some kind of silly lane thing that I just did right here. Okay, so with that said, 
when I see my A is positive, my B is positive, my steps are going up starting with a solid point. So here is what my graph should look like. I said I was going to make a mistake on purpose. Just reminding you about that. It would suck if it was at the very beginning, I have to redo everything. But I would do that too. So let's actually graph it then. All that was the explanation to get to the actual graph. So my graph is really the answer. If you're comfortable skipping all of that, some of that, or none of that, that's fine too. But fundamentally, it's the graph that's really going to be your answer here. So let's go ahead and graph this. Um, again, I'm not using the pull-down chart just because I find it's a little small for people in the back to see. The camera doesn't pick it up all that well either, so I'm just going to sort of put as clear as I possibly can here my scale. Let's start with the vertex. My vertex is 0, negative 1. 0, negative 1 is right there. It has to be a solid point. The vertex is always going to be a solid point. Then from there, I've got to sort of work with my height, my length, and my step direction to figure the rest of it out. We said earlier that the length is 1, but we also said that the steps look like this, which means the vertex, the solid point, is the starting of a step, not the ending of a step. So that means my step should go on to this direction this way. So there's my first step. I'm effectively going to copy and paste that a couple more times. Remember, I want three consecutive steps, please. So my next step should have a height of two away from that. So I'll put the next one right there. So starting right there, two away, to right there, one unit long. And maybe I've run out of a little bit of room. Maybe you want to go backwards. So I'll go backwards, I guess. Let's see. Uh, right here right here, I think that's two away, and there we go. There's my graph. Look at the board, find the mistake. Not a single person will say this. Not a single person will say this. You, will, you did not notice it at all. can't see it, eh? For me, it's obvious. My eyes are fine-tuned. I can see it every single time. And I'm, I'm never going to tell you how I see it, but I always, always see it. No. <laughs> Sorry. Did you uh, put the vertex no. in the No. No. did there. Sorry, now I'm checking the I, I accidentally make a different mistake. Charlie? No. No one sees it? No yeah. ruler. No ruler, you saw it. Oh. <laughs> Where? Um, in between the, the points. It was just this step. This was the only one I didn't use a ruler on. Everything else I used a ruler on. Oh. I see it every single time. Oh. It stands out. It, like, it haunts me in my dreams. I can see it, I can see it, I can see it. So later on when I rock around to take a look at, at your homework, what, three of you used a ruler? The rest of you have some pathetic little garbage <laughs> lines like that. Someone uh, a few years ago tried to argue for a quiz to get their marks back saying, this, they did this. But sir, I used a ruler. Is your ruler broken? <laughs> Actually, it is. Well, I don't care. That's, that's on you. If your ruler is broken, go get yourself a new ruler. So I can absolutely tell when a ruler is, when a ruler is used or not. So please, use a ruler. Let's correct ourselves. Now, Brad, at the same time, remember that if this was for Mark's quiz, a test, or exam, you'd always have a little grid. You don't have to make your own little grid or graph paper. You're always going to have one if you have to graph something. OK, so there's a full explanation for question two. I'll do a full explanation for question B, and then I'm going to speed it up for the rest of it. Anything else for question two in? That was a long explanation to get through that. Try not to make any more mistakes now. So question B, I'll go through again the full explanation here. I will speed it up though a little bit. So for question B, my A is negative one, my B is one half, my H is negative two, my K is positive one. There's challenge number one, just making sure you're cool with your parameters. My H and K give my vertex of negative 2, positive 1. And again, I know that's going to be a solid point. 
My A helps me get my height, which is positive one. My B helps me get my length. And it's the positive reciprocal. Okay. That means take the one half, make it positive, and flip the fraction. So when I make it positive, it's one half. When I flip the fraction, I get two over one, or just two. So there's my length. The combination of, H and, of uh, A and B will help me figure out the orientation of my steps. Not the one and the two, not that, but the negative A and the positive B. You don't see eye to eye, the relationship going in front of it. B is positive, so it's gonna start with a solid point. So it's gonna be looking like this. So the end of this, by the end of my graph, it should look like this. All of this stuff in yellow is stuff that you're welcome to write if you find it useful. If you don't need it, then you can skip it, of course. Let's make the graph over here. positive one is right here. Uh, my steps are going off that way in that direction and they're two units long. Oops, there we go. There's step number one. And give me two more consecutive steps. Maybe it's the two after, maybe it's the one before, one after, maybe it's the two before. It doesn't really make a difference. Uh, my height is one, so I'm going to have this right here and this right here. So still full explanation, just quicker, and then we get our graph. A little note about this, just to tie this back into the first question that we did, you can see the intercepts here, they're nice enough. You can see that the y-intercept is zero, where it touches the y-axis, you can see the x-intercept is that range from including zero to excluding two. So in this case, you actually could read the intercepts if you wanted to from the graph. Then we get to C and D, and C and D have their own little twists and turns. So either by now you either did have lots of time to finish C and D, or maybe you didn't get a chance to get to it, but I'm gonna go through it regardless. I'm also gonna see if I can skip the full explanation now, and just get to sort of the core pieces for question C and question D. So question C. Let me see if I can skip right to the graph. Now, a little bit of foresight can help here. The A is 10, which means the height's going to be 10. The B is negative 1 over 20. The reciprocal of that would give us a length of 20. The H is 0. The K is 0. That means I'm going to have a vertex at 0, 0. But since my height is 10, I'm not going to go by 1s. I'm also not going to go by 2s. I'm going to just go by 10s. If you decide to change your scale, then please tell me. If you don't tell me, I'm assuming it's 1. If you don't put any numbers on there, I'm assuming you're using 1. That's the default. My length is 20. If my length is 20, I could choose to go up by 10s as well. But I could go up by 20s if I wanted to. I can choose to go up by whatever I want. When you change your scale, you don't have to tell me every single one. Just tell me the first one. Then I know you're going up by 20s for all of them. Look, if you really wanted to, you can go up by any number. You can go up by sevens. I don't know why you would, but you could. So you can make the axes work for you if you need to. Our steps are going to be going down, starting with a hollow point, and they're 20 units long. So here's my first step. Here's my second step. And here's my third step. Once you get the hang of this, it is relatively quick. This question C. Question D, our last one. I think I stuck this into the lesson yesterday. I'll mention it one more time in case we've forgotten. Here's the rule. Your A is negative three, your B is negative four, your K is negative six, your H is not negative eight. As we spoke about yesterday, we have to factor it out here. So really, our rule, even though there's nothing wrong with this, this really should be kind of written like this. And when you see it written like this, you can see your A is negative 3, your B is negative 4, 
your H is positive two, not negative eight. It's positive two and your K is negative six. So if you actually want to see your proper parameters, your B has to be factored out. There's nothing wrong with leaving it like this if you understand that you have to do that, but again, that's your call. So I'm going to graph this guy. Now there's an issue here. The issue being that even though the height's going to be three, my B of negative four gives me a length of, make it positive and flip it. Negative four turns into one quarter length, 0.25. So you have your option of you can either change your scale and go by 0.25s or stay with one. I think what I tend to see is most students don't change scales. Most students just like to go by one. So I'll do D by keeping the scale at one. So keeping the scale at one. I personally wouldn't, but I think most students do do this. So I'll do it as well. But I'm just going to make my gaps a little bit bigger so I can see it a little bit better. Um, and my Y, so I'm going to have to go by three. I can go by three, I guess. So this is going to be three, but this is going to be one. My vertex is positive two, negative six. Positive two, negative six is going to be right here. My step length are one quarter long. They're going up, starting with a hollow point, which means one quarter is going to be really, really small. This is the drawback of sort of using a scale of one here. It's hard to see. It's there. I can approximate as best as I can. My step height is three, so my next step is right here. One quarter long, and then right here, one quarter long. Those are the three steps. Leave it at that. We'll take a look at the homework. Am I doing something?